So now I get a chance to introduce one of my heroes. Uh, John Palfrey uh, is a feral librarian. <laughs> now, yeah, this is a term in his book, which I'd never heard before, but which also describes me, which is to say we're wild and untrained. We're not professional librarians. He started out as a law professor. Uh, he was the, uh, uh, sorry, I'm gonna get it wrong again, vice dean, vice, there, I did get right, uh, of the Harvard Law School, and they asked him to, to run the Harvard Law Library, um, which he did, over the objections of some professional librarians, a, a fact which I know the uh, Missouri Library Association opposed my appointment uh, at this august body. They're now all my good friends. Um, <laughs> But uh, uh, so he became, he, he became uh, the head of the Harvard uh, Law Library. Um, he also uh, uh, founded, it was one of the founders of and inspirations for and is now the chairman of the board of the Digital Public Library of America, which he will, I'm sure, be talking about uh, tonight, which, which becomes one of the libraries uh, uh, and certainly a library partner uh, of, the, of the future. Um, and he'll, talk, he'll tell you a little bit uh, about that. He's also chairman of the board of the Knight Foundation, which is one of the great uh, funders and thought leaders uh, of schools, libraries, everything to do with print, uh, really everything to do with information and how information becomes knowledge, we hope, uh, in, uh, in this world. And last but not least, he's the headmaster of Andover, uh, the, the boarding school, a boarding school that I happened to, to go to, my father went to, uh, a couple of my daughters, one of my daughters is still there, and I'm hoping that my introduction was kind enough that it will improve her GPA. <laughs> And so, lady, ladies and gentlemen, uh, John Palfrey. Thank you, Crosby. And Madeline Kemper, I can assure you, needs no help with her GPA, which is excellent. Um, and I could not be more proud that you then, that you and she, during her spring break, we're getting in trouble in the governor's office, arguing for libraries. I think this is, but for a high school to be able to claim both you and um, and your daughter uh, for this spring break, I couldn't couldn't be prouder and more excited. I think that form of civil disobedience is exactly what teenagers should be up to when they're not in your fabulous teen center downstairs. Um, I've had just a wonderful day in part being able to tour this library, and as someone who's worked on a book about libraries uh, called Bibliotech. Um, I can tell you I've looked at a lot of libraries and had a chance to tour uh, many. Um, I have, think I died and went to heaven. This library is unbelievable as to what you have going on. It is not just the physical space, but everything that's happening is really extraordinary. So thank you. It's really, it's just a huge inspiration to see a community that clearly has supported this institution to make it um, a, a core part of this community, but also just to see from the little kids, I don't know if you've walked up the steps in that little kid library, but you just see the opening of wonder in a child's life when they see that beautiful mural ahead of them and the teen space behind and the, um, the great special collections room. It's just amazing what you're doing. So um, bravo and thank you for the inspiration. Um, I didn't know it, but when I started writing this book, called Bibliotech. I was actually really writing it for this situation in a way that's happening in Missouri right now with respect to uh, cuts to libraries. I felt like when I became a library director, I had over and over again an unusual conversation, which just surprised me so much. And it went something like this. I'd be at a backyard barbecue or whatever, um, and I would have friends, you know, would come over and say, what are you up to? And I said, I'm really excited. I'm, I'm becoming the director of a library. And they would look at me kind of funny, like you're not trained as a librarian. Like, what, what are you, what, why? You're a law professor. Um, and I would say, it's true. I'm not trained as a librarian, but I really believe in, you know, libraries, dot, dot, dot. And I'd start getting into this whole argument. Um, and they'd say, wait, 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 I get it. You're the digital guy, because my field is digital media. You're there just to get rid of the library, right? Now I get it. You're the one who's going to like shut it down. Um, and then the person would be off getting a drink or whatever. And I'd never get to say, no, 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 I actually think they're more important than ever. Um, so I had this, argue, this conversation over and over again and then started to realize that in community after community, and it's not just in Missouri, it's been in Ohio a couple years ago, there was a high profile fight in Chicago um, quite recently, in Miami quite recently, in New York over and over again, there are fights about whether or not to fund libraries. Um, and that's the public libraries, of course. And then you think about in universities and in um, context of historical societies and archives, we, I think, over and over again devalue 
how important these institutions are to our democracy, just in a really fundamental way. So I wanted to write this book as a lay person, not a librarian, really as a love letter to libraries and people who work in them, and to try to help make the argument that I hope that your governor and your legislature will listen to, and actually say, no, these are tiny, tiny investments compared to the other civic investments we make in our community, and they pay off in so many ways. The benefits to young people, the benefits to job seekers, the benefits to every citizen really just is remarkable. And I actually would go even further um, than the arguments that I think some people make, which is to say libraries are just as important in a digital age as they've been. I actually think libraries are more important in a digital age than they've been in the past for a variety of uh, reasons I will, uh, I will argue in a moment. Um, and I was uh, on the plane here, had the chance to read uh, an amazing speech, which there's a printed version out here if you see it, Libraries as Acts of Civic Renewal, which Vartan Gregorian, the um, uh, great director of the New York Public Library, university president, now president of the Carnegie Corporation, gave here at the Kansas City Club um, uh, 13 years ago to commemorate the, the rest restoration of this building. And there were a couple of things that he wrote um, in this that I wanted just to, to cite as I, um, as I get into my remarks tonight. Um, one thing, he tells the story about budget cuts in New York, um, and he said, that's the way it was. Our library was underfunded, underappreciated, with many of its buildings falling apart and inadequately staffed. The library's constituents, as library constituents almost everywhere, were unorganized and not vocal. As a result, politicians took it for granted that libraries were not priorities and that library budgets could be slashed with impunity. That's 13 years ago, describing what, was ha what had happened in New York decades before that. So you hear the echoes of it again today. Um, and he talks, he tells this wonderful story about the importance of libraries. Um, and one thing he says along the way, and this is 13 years ago, he says, I should mention that my fellow educators, librarians, information scientists, all communicators of culture and creators of knowledge continue to rock this cradle of democracy libraries even as it moves into cyberspace. And so the story I wanted to tell in a way was about how we need to do this even more importantly as we move into cyberspace and how that's going. And I actually think it's an extremely exciting time in the development of libraries and in the development really of partnerships between libraries and people who work in the information field outside of libraries in ways that I think will foster a stronger democracy, but only if we get it right. And I think in many, many respects, we're at risk of actually having this break in the wrong direction and actually have an, a less democratic world um, in a digital era, not a, more so. And I think that would be a really perverse outcome of what is such an exciting set of democratic opportunities. So that's, I've already told you the whole of my argument, that's it, um, I, I'm not very the lead at all, that's what I'm, that's what I'm arguing, um, but let me tell it in a slightly roundabout way. Um, I don't think anybody will be able to tell me what this image is, but, but if you do, shout it out. It's, a, it, it's an image from, uh, somebody have a guess? No, it's, a, um, it's an image from the, uh, the special collections of the library I used to work in, the Harvard Law School Library. And it's the personal, it's a picture of the personal library of Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. Um, and I thought of this in part because you were talking about your Supreme Court series and having Sandra Day O'Connor here. Um, and Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. was a professor at Harvard Law School, but then became a Supreme Court justice. Um, and I love this picture because it shows his personal library in Washington, D.C. when he was a justice. And I love just thinking about that seat right there and you know, Mr. Justice Holmes coming home at the end of a long day and sitting in that seat and starting to think about the opinions he was gonna write or have his clerk write, however the case might be. But of course, he surrounds himself with these floor to ceiling books and you can see you know, even books way up here in the corner and you can just imagine him being inspired by this personal library and bringing it uh, to him. Um, he wrote many wonderful opinions. He also wrote some terrible clangers of opinions, but um, you can't blame that on the books. Um, but uh, you can just to kind of see him sitting there. And the reason that I, I like it and, and think about it all the time is, what is the version for our kids that is like this, that's just as inspiring? And if we think about Maddie Kemper, who's a junior in high school, or we think about um, the young people who are now actually using libraries more than ever, by the way. The libraries are very attractive to kids these days in really wonderful ways. Um, what is the inspiring space that they are going to want to have around them? And how can we create in a digital era just as exciting and just as thoughtful a space as they increasingly are using digital uh, forms of information uh, as well as books? So um, it is not the case, of course, that, that books are gonna go away, but it is the case that they can get much of what they need, including books and other information through a search on Google uh, here. Um, and increasingly, um, when you look at the usage patterns in young people's libraries, 
libraries, they tend not to be going and doing this and pulling a book off the shelf, even though many kids still, still like books. Um, I can tell you when I was running the Harvard Law School Library, our library was full, full, full of students, constantly full. Every seat was full. It was wonderful to see. Um, but they had laptops in front of them, and they had a coffee that had a you know approved mug on, you know with the top on it. Um, but they were there doing their work. But I never once in four years of running that library saw a kid do this and actually pull one of the law books off the thing. Not once. Now, in part, law is a particular case. Everything has been digitized really well in a variety of databases. But it struck me that they were not there to pull off the books. The books were there, but they sort of were furnished. Right? The kids were in that environment in a social way because they wanted to be there and connected to one another and do this in a way together, but it was not ultimately because the books were there. Um, Crosby was telling me earlier about how genealogy, of course, is a very important thing that libraries have done, um, that even as the genealogy records, genealogical records have gone online and are not at so much in those physical books that people still pull up to great uh, libraries in their Winnebago's together because they actually want to do the genealogical work together in a physical space, even if it's not the physical book. So I think this is a really interesting design challenge. How do we create a space that's as wonderful as this for our kids and as that creates the same sense of wonder and nostalgia the physical libraries had, even if the books themselves are not what's relevant and not what's bringing them in to the space? Um, my local library in Boston um, is the Boston Public Library, and I, th I take really great just uh, kind of civic pride in this particular space. Um, it's one of the earliest, um, if not the earliest, big municipal public library um, in the world, um, and it has uh, a, a building um, that's right set in Copley Square. Um, and what I love about it most is this line right here, which says, free to all. I get chills every time I look at that. Mm -hmm. To think that there was a moment in our history in the middle of the 19th century when a group of philanthropists and sort of civic-minded people, a guy named Joshua Bates in particular, put up the money, said, if you are willing as a city to have a municipal library that is open to anyone, we'll buy a bunch of books and we'll build a grand space. He wanted a space that could accommodate, you know, maybe 100 people or so um, in a grand reading room, much as you have a grand reading room downstairs, that they would just do this and they would make it constantly free to all. That principle is actually sort of a modern one, right? It's the middle of the 19th century in the United States that, that we start to create these institutions. And my fear in the digital age is that we actually might lose that free to all principle. And why is this so? I think part of it is that if the trajectory for, in terms of people using digital books increasingly toward ebooks um, continues, and if many people are able just to buy what they need or to download it immediately to their Kindle or their iPad, um, that in some respects you could imagine a world in which the public part of this, the public part of libraries, actually kind of gets cut out of the equation that ultimately if people get what they need just by downloading it, there'd be less of a uh, demand in a civic sense to come to a physical place and to get information free to all. And I worry a lot about that future. And I think part of what we need to do is to make the affirmative argument in favor of a free to all environment in the digital space as well as in the physical space um, for the future. I think one of the reasons this is dangerous is that so much information, so much knowledge is moving into the cloud-based environment. Now, you could argue with me and say, in fact, no, we're never going to get to a place where all materials stop being in physical form because so many people love physical books. How many people here prefer a physical book to read, by the way? How many people prefer a digital book to read? Very few. And how many people love? Force to use a digital book. How, how come? Because the font is too small. The font is too small, <laughs> yes. And you get to the, the you bigger, you can, you can adjust, that's absolutely right. And how many people um, just love both and they're just omnivorous? How many what? How many love both? You actually are omnivores and you, you like them both. And it's actually, I think that may be the growing number in sense when you look at um, some of the results the publishers have. I think for many people who actually use digital materials and digital books for a variety of reasons, they also tend to be very good buyers and users of physical books, interestingly. So publishers who were, I think, sweating this a few years ago are sweating it much less right now because people who love the digital books are actually often paying for them. Libraries are not eating their lunch by giving away huge numbers of, um, uh, of digital books. And the people using digital books are actually often buying physical books as well in, in, uh, in a format. But what, what is definitely happening is knowledge is moving to a cloud-based environment. Um, and much of what's important about the cloud, and these are some examples of the service providers in, in the cloud, almost all of the providers of the cloud are private enterprises. They are owned by private companies. So um, many of them very uh, well-meaning and public-spirited, um, but they are not public institutions like libraries. So think about what libraries have historically done. They've been able to buy physical objects 
and bring them to a, a place, a glorious building like this one or a branch library and make them available free to all. But if you follow this trajectory and knowledge, which is created in the form of a book, a digital book or an image or a movie or a, um, a sound file, all is held in private hands in the cloud, in the internet, then when librarians, who are the collection development people, wish to bring something to their library, what they're doing is ultimately becoming renters or leasers of the information rather than owners of it, right? So when a library goes to a publisher and says, give me some books that are digital and I want to lend them out, it's not based on the background law of copyright, it's actually based on a contract. So why is this important? Well, in, in, the, in the analog world, there's something really important called the first sale doctrine. The first sale doctrine says when somebody buys a book, you then own that physical copy and you can do anything you want with it. You can tear it up, right? You can sell it in a secondhand bookstore, you can give it to somebody else. And importantly, libraries rely on this and a bunch of other aspects of the law to be able to do what they do. But think about a digital future a digital future in which when librarians go to the publishers, they don't actually buy the physical object, they just get a contract. And you know what that contract says? The contract says at any point if you stop paying for this license, you can stop owning the, physical, the, the digital object, right? Um, it's a very difficult proposition, which is libraries could become renters of all of this information and not owners. We would actually not have in these amazing communities, the physical objects in the form of the books owned by the librarians. And this is actually sort of a non-trivial and complicated problem, especially if librarians are not the keepers of the information and publishers are. So when I was a library director, three times I had the very bizarre experience of having publishers come to me and ask me for titles that their company had published in the 20th century, which they no longer had a copy of. Why? The publishing company in, this, in these cases had acquired a bunch of other publishing companies, some of which had gone out of business. So they didn't actually have physical objects. They didn't have the physical copies of the books that they own the copyright to. So they had to go to libraries, my library, to get a copy of the books they owned. So in this case, they could digitize it and sell it back to me as a librarian. That was what they wanted to do. You see the problem. Um, publishers are wonderful and important and not the enemy by any stretch of the imagination, but probably not the best keepers of our cultural and our scientific and our historical record, right? Libraries are, archives are, our government is, our you know, civic institutions are, but probably not for-profit concerns. And I don't think we have figured out what this trajectory is going to be like. And right now, it's just weird one-off deals that are contracts between libraries and, um, uh, and publishers. And very often, Publishers, this is a little bit less uh, dire than it was a couple years ago, but very often publishers are not keen to lend their titles, in digital format anyway, to libraries. Why is this? Or to sell them for lending purposes. They worry about the pajamas at 3 a.m. problem. What is the pajamas at 3 a.m. problem? That problem is a fear that people will just borrow digital books from libraries for free at 3 a.m. when they're in pajamas and just borrow lots of them and not buy them. So worried about the pajamas at 3 a.m. problem, many of, in fact for a long time, none of the big five publishers would in fact sell to libraries the ability to lend ebooks. Now I think that is diminished. Random House has started to allow libraries on a one-off basis to take a particular title and then lend it as long as they had a license to it. Um, so Random House, I think, did a very good thing. One of the other publishers um, tried something called the 26 Lens policy. Did anybody follow this? The idea was the libraries could get a license to a book, but they could only lend the digital book 26 times. Why? The theory was that's when it would wear out. Yeah. Right? Librarians laughed, just as you did, um, and it was not a particularly good scheme. But you see the, the difficulty, which is if librarians actually can't get access to the digital books that people want, and if you assume this trajectory continues, libraries can get cut out of this, uh, out of this important future. Um, at a minimum, we don't have the ability, I think, to be that free to all kind of institution that libraries have been in the past. So it's not that it necessarily will go in that direction, it's just that there is a risk of that happening, and I think it could be a very bad thing. This image is of the digital public library, of, uh, rather the Boston Public Library as it was being built um, in, uh, uh, in uh, you can see 1890 over here. So the free to all thing goes right there. Um, and I like to think about this image because I think we're at a similar moment in the, uh, the digital era that this was in the physical in, uh, arena. So if you think about back then, when you were trying to figure out how do you build a physical library, how do you create um, a physical library, you were actually literally building what libraries 
libraries would become. I think we're at that same moment for digital libraries. And I think this is why this moment of activism, of going up to the governor, and also thinking about what we need to create to ensure that libraries can actually provide the same free to all services that they have in the analog era is, uh, is possible in the digital. I think we're at that kind of a pivotal moment. Um, this is a side elevation of um, the building that I uh, used to work in called Langdell Hall at Harvard Law School, and this is a library. Um, and uh, the reason I think this, this particular picture is fun and interesting is that it makes you think about what is the process by which we have designed physical buildings, and how does that actually help guide us at this, at this digital moment? Um, so with respect to physical buildings, in this, when this building was built, you brought together architects, and you brought together librarians, you brought together professors who were gonna teach in this building, um, and you would design something as an architect would. I think in the digital era, we're at exactly the same moment where what we need to bring together are architects who are information architects, who are gonna think about creating this digital world that will be as wonderful, if not more wonderful, um, and to create the connections between the digital world and the physical. So what is the connection between the things that are being digitized here in Kansas City and what's happening in this physical space? What is the connection between the physical gatherings that we have and the digital environment that we're creating? Um, and I think it's a very different form of design, and it's a very different form of advocacy um, that we have to uh, engage in. And I'm not sure that we are yet up to that task. Um, so the, the story I want to tell uh, a bit uh, on behalf of libraries is the process that we've been going through to create a digital public library for this country. Um, so why would we want to do this? The inspiration is to say, at this moment, if you believe my argument, that we could go down a bad path relative to um, uh, the digital world, is to say, let's figure out how we can have that same kind of mid-19th century moment for the digital era right now and actually construct it in a really public-spirited way. Rather than having so much of the work being done in the private sector, what if we raised our hands as the, the public sector in a broad sense and said, let's design libraries and digital information for the public interest. So what we did was we convened 40 people um, about five years ago in a room at, uh, at Harvard University at Radcliffe College, and the people in, involved were people who were computer scientists and uh, information architects, as well as people who ran foundations and big librarians and so forth, and we said, let's actually work together to create a platform for libraries that will support every public library in the country, and in fact, all uh, library users, that will create this uh, the, uh, digital platform that will serve uh, in the same free-to-all way, and it will be an alternative to a pathway that might be um, dominated by the private sector. And sort of amazingly enough, we came up with um, a very long sentence that everybody agreed to. Um, the it, librarians have famously actually argued a fair amount about what the future should be like and how to do it. But we actually came up to something, um, uh, an agreement to create an open distributed network of comprehensive online resources to draw on the nation's living heritage from libraries, universities, archives, and museums to educate and inform and empower everyone in the current and future generations. No small ambition, right? Totally crazy on some level. But I also think entirely possible then the, the, the wonderful thing I think about the digital era is that we can make more information available to more people if we design it correctly. And that's why it's such a perverse idea that we might actually have less of it available. But there are lots of things that stand in the way, I think, of this bright future for libraries. And I think we need to work together to create it. Um, so you might say, what in fact are the elements of a library in a digital age? I think they're very similar to the elements of a library in an analog age or in the age we live in, but we actually have to adapt them in meaningful ways for the future, and I think it's entirely possible to do it. Um, I'm going to describe them in terms of what we have designed for the Digital Public Library of America, but I think ultimately they relate um, to what we need for uh, the physical world as well. Um, in the first instance, um, one thing that we need is to have metadata for, um, uh, uh, for information. And this is one of the things that ultimately is uh, a, a big part of what libraries do. Um, they need to be connecting that metadata to data. So what does that mean? It means that the things that librarians have done so well to help us find information, the things that catalogers do, the things that um, actually um, put information in subject headings, the things that make it possible to browse on a shelf, I think we need to do that for a digital age in the same way. But we can actually share all of that information. And it needs to be tied ultimately to, the, um, to what we're creating digitally um, and created uh, in the form of digital code. So if we could create 
for this country a series of things that include open access to the metadata, open access to the data itself, and open access to the computer code, I think anybody could take advantage of this great um, system. So that's ultimately what we're seeking to do. Um, we're bringing people together in this process and saying if we were all, as we digitize the materials, to put it into a shared, bless you, in a shared repository of um, this code and this metadata um, and this information, that anybody then can take it and build upon that platform. So if you think about the way in which the internet has been built, it's something that actually was given by Sir Tim Berners-Lee in a way to the world in the form of the World Wide Web, which allowed anybody without having to have a patent or to have a, um, have a license to create uh, new applications on the top of, uh, of the system of the World Wide Web. I think that's ultimately what we have to do for libraries. Um, and that's the process that we have begun, creating an open environment where anybody can actually do this coding and bringing them together. And importantly, a part of that, in addition to the metadata and, to, and this particular code, we actually need to digitize the materials that are not uh, accessible today. And I think any library and any archive and any museum today who is, uh, has a collection is often in the, in the business of trying to figure out, do we make this more accessible on the internet? If, it doesn't, uh, if it's not accessible on the internet, does it actually exist for many of our patrons? Now, if you're the Nelson Atkins Museum, of course, having this beautiful space and the physical objects for people to come to is very important. But you might also imagine that digitizing the materials and having people from very far away know that they can see it and find it actually brings people to Kansas City, it turns out. Um, and likewise, a, a library like this, which has unique materials, by virtue of digitizing the materials, you actually draw people in, by and large, rather than have them stay home and look at them online. It's a sort of a counterintuitive idea, but I actually think it's entirely accurate. Um, and part of that is because the use case, what people do, does tend to be through your device, looking something up on Google and so forth. But people actually still want to come together. They want to see those physical objects and they want to touch them and bring them um, uh, for their usage. They want to underline them uh, and, and, uh, and use them in the way that you have physical books. So I think one of the big pushes that we have to engage in is this third point about content. We actually want to digitize, have a mass digitization movement in this country that would digitize our historical record. And a lot of this is happening in bits and pieces. Lots of institutions are doing it already. So the National Archives is, our, is uh, digitizing as fast as it can many of the things in National Archives. Um, we have uh, lots of big institutions like Harvard, like New York Public, um, like the Kansas City Public Library that are digitizing their collections. And then you've got small institutions. You have historical societies and so forth that are digitizing their records. But it turns out that right now they're very hard to find. I defy you actually to find the things I spent millions of dollars to digitize at Harvard just using Google. It's actually very hard to get into those, um, those data sets. So one of the key elements, I think, of building this digital future for libraries is simply making it accessible in a common place, regardless of where you're coming from. So it's one thing to have the metadata out there, it's one thing to have the computer code, it's one thing to digitize it, but actually finding a way um, to bring all of these materials together is a crucial piece of the puzzle. Um, fourth, um, we think about this as being tools and services. So we have to build for the, f for the future of libraries um, new forms of services for people. I think ultimately it's amazing to have access through a device, a digital um, uh, uh, mobile device or, uh, um, or a computer, but it's ultimately um, quite a different thing to have a human being help you find exactly what you need. And if you have encountered one of the amazingly helpful librarians here in this building, I'm sure you know exactly what I mean, which is not everybody has the skill to use this environment um, uh, equally. We have digital divides among our kids who don't have um, all the skills. So we need to figure out what are the tools and services that people need and what is the human role of librarians in this picture. It is not simply enough to have a digital environment. You actually need humans to, to interact with it. So one of the things we're building with the Digital Public Library of America is a series of services that mean that um, people from uh, a remote area could help somebody in another place. So one example that I like very much is the idea of the Scanabago. So the Scanabago combines the idea of a Winnebago and a scanner. So think about it this way. If you think about all the towns in Missouri or Kansas City, if you come from across the state line, um, you have lots and lots of pockets out there of historical societies or small libraries that have lots of materials, but you actually don't have people who necessarily know how to do that scanning or do that creation of the metadata. 
So one of the people who is uh, volunteering on the DPLA, this is an all, almost all volunteer effort, came up with the idea that what we ought to do is get a bunch of Winnebagos and start driving them around the country with scanners in the back. And I love this idea. You think about library students and retired librarians and just volunteers like us getting in Winnebago's and driving them across the country and pulling up to a you know, historical society and say, bring out your scans, like bring out your stuff and we will help you do it. Um, we will help you scan the material, create this national resource and we'll help you figure out what is it, I use that crazy term metadata, how do you create some metadata? Metadata is really just a description, a series of descriptions of the material, um, but I think if we had a core of people fanning out across the country in these Scannabagos, you could see the documentary just like writing itself. It's a fabulous idea, and I'm, I'm very eager to drive one. Anyway, um, I think it would be a lot of fun. I also wrote a letter to the president of the Winnebago Company. That person doesn't happen to be here, does he? No. Um, <coughs> the president of the Winnebago Company has not yet responded to me. He does, hasn't liked this idea as much as I do, so we might need Windstream or some other company to help. Um, it doesn't, we can't, I don't have as good a name for the windscreen plus scanner. But you get the idea, which is if you could imagine a national movement of uh, people who are very enthusiastic about creating this digital future and fanning out across the country and engaging people in creating cultural heritage in this way, I think could be very exciting and dynamic. And the big institutions will continue to do it as the National Archives or as Harvard and the Smithsonian are doing, and they're all contributing it already um, to the DPLA. I think it could be amazing. So the idea really is to create a series of on-ramps that will bring this information all into one place um, where people can find it. Um, and last, the fifth element um, we think of um, as libraries and as the, as the digital public library is simply people. The human connection is such a crucial, crucial element of what libraries are. I am completely convinced that good librarians are more important than they were before because the information environment is much more complex. I think, I think about it as a teacher, as a, as a high school teacher and as a principal, when I think about our kids who are writing, I'm teaching US history this year, um, for their US history paper, they have so many more sources than ever before to consult. And there's so much more variety in terms of its quality than there was once, right? So if you just had the Encyclopedia Britannica to go to, it was either reliable or it wasn't, but it was sort of where you started, right? It was the place you go. Now you might go online, they almost always Google the material that they're after. So I have my students working on a project on something you didn't know much about, which was the Spanish-American War. So they would Google Spanish-American War and hit enter, right? Um, and then they would, 100% of the kids would then go to the Wikipedia entry, which was the first thing, right? And it was only then that the kids would have some variation in the way in which they approach the material. Some of the kids who were really sophisticated said, oh my gosh, this is totally not trustworthy because the kid before me actually could have gone in there and messed it up, right, just to mess up my paper. And that's the sort of sophisticated kid. And then on the naive end of the spectrum, there are kids who just would cut and paste what's there and you know, put it in their paper and get a bad grade, but you know, we, we know this happens. Um, also, 100% of the kids um, we surveyed and, and, and did focus groups of would go down to the bottom of the Wikipedia page and would actually um, for, go to the sources that are there. So there's a really great opportunity, I think, for libraries and others to work on those sources that are in Wikipedia pages because people use them so consistently. But the point is that you actually need people to help you learn this digital literacy, the ability to sort the credible from the not credible, to figure out what's the sweet spot between being the sophisticated kid and the totally naive kid. Um, and as Crosby said, we know from the data, lots of national surveys and lots of localized surveys, that this skews really badly in a socioeconomic way and it skews really badly along racial lines, which is to say the most sophisticated kids are the kids who are at the highest SES levels and they're the kids who tend to be white rather than kids of color. So we know that there's huge digital divides out there in terms of not just accessing the technology, the one that, that Crosby noted so importantly, but also in terms of the sophistication in this environment. So I come back to the importance of people, librarians, in this equation. It is so crucial to have guides like the amazing teen um, services that you guys have here in Kansas City as guides to kids that are outside of schools um, to help them with this. And ultimately also, I just think that the community of librarians and people who work in archives and in museums are such a vibrant and public spirited group of people that I think that spirit that has animated and made Wikipedia by far the best encyclopedia, which I absolutely think it is in the world, I think that applied to libraries could be an incredibly fun thing to do. So what we've, we've been um, uh, doing as part of DPLA is every year or so having an event, it happens to be uh, in a couple weeks in Indianapolis, um, and we've modeled it on the way the Wikipedians have created um, their amazing community. Um, has anybody ever been to a Wikimania? 
Sorry, no, no Wikimaniacs here. Um, so uh, every year or so, the Wikipedia community comes together at some place and the, the cities vie for this like an Olympic bid. So we in Cambridge, Mass, in Boston, we bid on a Wikimania and we said, come here and bring all your, your guys and we competed against Toronto and we won. And we had all of these Wikimaniacs come from all over the world Lots and lots of drunk German graduate students, it turns out. Um, I can <laughs> give you some first-hand accounts of this. But lots of people who are extremely excited about creating this digital resource, which is Wikipedia. Um, and they, they come and they sort of geek out for a few days and create, um, create it and they improve things. Um, I could imagine the same thing happening for libraries, which is to say people who love libraries or people who actually work in them or have retired from them coming together periodically and just improving what we have as this digital resource. So we are starting that process with this um, DPLA fest, we call it, that's happening each year. I just see huge amounts of benefit from collaboration and people working um, uh, as a community toward the public interest um, and creating this digital resource that I think will be um, something that will uh, be so helpful to all libraries and all people who work in them. Um, this is the most technical I will get in a technical, um, uh, a technically relevant topic, which is um, to describe the way in which um, I think the DPLA uh, works and, um, and I think libraries will work in a, in a technical sense in the future. Um, if you see the middle, this is really what um, we've created in, uh, in technology terms, which is an open application um, programming interface. Um, a series of metadata, which is where that, um, that information resides, um, and then a way to ingest it, to bring it in. Um, so the idea is not to create one big kind of digital Fort Knox, one place where everything resides, but really to lean into the fact that so many different institutions are creating this information and have just a way for people to get access to it and then to create the applications um, that will get people to, um, to use it. So, um, uh, the, the architecture here is to create a series of service hubs. These are state hubs. Missouri has one. I think Kansas does not have one yet. Um, we've got, I think, 15 across the country. And these are the on-ramps that say if you digitize something in this state, it will actually end up in this digital and uh, national repository. Um, content hubs are the big institutions, so the National Archives, Smithsonian, um, Harvard, New York Public. These are institutions that are digitizing as much of the, their collections as they can and then feeding them up into this national resource. Um, this export thing is actually really important. Um, this is the idea that anybody could take everything that's in this digital uh, library that we've created and export it and create an alternate system. Why is this important? Because maybe we didn't get it right. This is the sort of humility principle. And actually, it's one of the things that's been so wonderful about the internet is in so many respects, you could actually take what is open access and recreate an environment. This is coming out of the open software movement that allows people to take all of that code that exists and then create a better project somewhere else. And I think in the digital era, that's a super important architectural thing to do. Um, and then last is this idea of having multiple front ends. So this may seem highly technical, but it's actually really simple as an idea. Um, if you were to want to access everything that is now in the DPLA, you can do it by going to dp.la online. And we've created a search-like interface and a bunch of ways you can get access to it, and it's really simple. Um, but my hunch is that there are people in this room who could do better than what we've done. So our idea is to say anybody can create their own front ends for DPLA. Maybe what you're going to create a better one for a digital device. Maybe you're going to create one for enormous screens. Maybe you're going to create one for Kansas City only. Maybe you're going to create one for New York only. Um, and I'm convinced that people will do better than we have done as a central repository, and that will be wonderful. So if, no, if somebody comes to all of this information and it's curated so helpfully for Kansas City and nobody knows it came from the Digital Public Library of America, I will be delighted. I think that would be a perfect outcome in the digital age and it would be something that would uh, allow us to supplement what so many libraries are doing. Um, so that's the overall architecture of this system. Um, this is, as I mentioned, the front end that we have created. Um, this is the place that you can go and explore it. So you can look at particular exhibitions that have been curated. Um, you can look at, um, explore it by place or by date, and you can uh, search on the materials. But again, I think that, that um, the collected community of uh, people who work in libraries and people who work um, in technology companies can do better and, and be delighted if you end up um, having a more popular way to get into the material than we have. 
Um, ultimately, the way in which this will scale, which I think is a, is a crucial thing, um, is to ensure that you've got lots and lots of people who can contribute to it, and that it ends up being a place um, that uh, takes this material and makes it freely available. Um, so the notion, again, is not to have any central repository, but to have something that uh, enables anybody who has digitized something to be able to bring it into this resource. And importantly, to have people who are librarians who will choose what belongs in it, what is helpful. So this is, again, where that human curation is so important. I don't think the point of the DPLA is to be the internet itself, to be everything, but rather it's a way in which um, the role of the librarian might change a little bit. You might be choosing what ultimately ought to go into this National Archive um, uh, based upon uh, this pilot system we've created. Um, right now, this is a, a description of the country in terms of where this, um, this project rests. These are the DPLA um, hubs that are up and running. Um, we've got others in active development. Um, if you live in any of the states that have not yet got a hub, we would love to um, uh, talk to you and, and, uh, and create it. Also, if you happen to run a big cultural institution and you would like to become uh, one of the content hubs, we would love to do that too. And um, what's been fun is in many different states there have been uh, arguments about who gets to be the service hub for that state, which I think is a wonderful state of affairs. And hopefully in the next two years we will complete this map and we will then have um, a digital library platform uh, for the country. Um, I promised you no technical slides, so I'm going to skip over this um, most technical of all. But the most important thing on it um, is the idea of, of users. I think this is one of the things that libraries have started to do so well, and I would give enormously high marks to this library which is to think in terms of design and human-centered design. I think the beautiful exhibits and the way in which this library presents material to people is so important, and increasingly so in a digital era. If you think about, bless you, the way in which you know, Google and Facebook and Twitter and uh, Amazon present things, it is such an effective design mechanism, and that's why these, these uh, companies are so successful. I think libraries need to design materials really carefully and interfaces much in the way the corporations have. Um, so getting this, um, uh, the user interface, uh, I think is a crucial part of the story. Um, and ultimately, I think there's a chance to create real wonder and real um, new forms of nostalgia that haven't existed. One of the arguments that I make in this book that's coming out, Bibliotech, is that I worry about librarians um, kind of resting on the old nostalgia. Um, and I think that there is real power in nostalgia. If you think about the experience you first had as a child walking into a library and having the entire world opened up to you, right? I just I think that's such a powerful image. Um, but I fear, in a way, that if kids are not having quite that same experience and where the digital environment is doing that, that that, may, that nostalgia may be too thin a read to cling to, in a way, for libraries. So I think part of the challenge, in a way, is for libraries to create new senses of nostalgia, to create new things that actually have that same opening and sense of wonder for kids. So one of the things that I worry we will lose if we um, have fewer people going into physical libraries and more people going in digital environments is the idea of serendipity. I don't know if you've all had the same experience, but when you go, you, you have the call number, right? And you're going to find that one book or that one periodical and you walk in the stacks and you're thinking you're coming out with one book and you come out with 12 books, right? Because you've seen all of these great things that are arrayed next to these other books and it's a wonderful, wonderful moment, right? I fear that if all you're doing is like a pinpoint search and you're actually not being exposed to some other things around it, um, that you might not, you would come out with one book, right, instead of 12 books. Now maybe that would be good for, you know, for your free time or whatever, um, but I don't think it's actually good for knowledge and for the way kids learn and the way that, uh, that people learn. But I don't think necessarily that the digital world has to be worse than the physical world in this respect. And I think this is where the excitement comes in in terms of innovation in libraries. Um, so one of the projects that I, uh, created at, at my last job was the idea of trying to uh, do better when, you come, when it comes to creating a stack environment online than in a physical space. So one of the ways to think about this is in New York, um, there are three huge library systems, right? There's the New York Public Library System, there's the Brooklyn Public Library System, and Queens. Um, and between them, they've got 100 and something branches. There are many, many, many places. So if you were looking for a book in New York, there's actually not one stack. Right? There's not one place you can look into and see all of those things arrayed. Ditto for my university at Harvard, we had 73 different libraries and much of our material, about half of it, was in a repository uh, 26 miles away. So again, there was no stack you could look, walk into. You couldn't actually have that full serendipity effect. So what we created 
was a virtual stack, um, and its name was Stack View, um, and it is it exists, and it's a way that you can actually go on the DPLA site and see everything. But the idea was to say, create virtually that one stack for all of those 73 libraries, or all of the libraries in New York, or all of the libraries in greater Kansas City you know, across state lines, right? You could imagine creating digital versions that actually might be as effective, or even possibly even better, than in the physical stack. Um, and one of the, the sort of funky things we've done was to say, also, you could figure out a way to array these materials in a fashion that's different than by the conventional form of uh, your, um, uh, your call numbers and so forth. So in this particular uh, example, what we created was one that was based on circulation. So we called it a circulation heat map. We took some old data from 2009. Um, and in this particular case, we show the materials that if you were to search in the Harvard libraries for um, Pynchon's Gravity's Rainbow, you would see you would actually find the right book. Um, but it would be colored. Um, first of all, you could see how fat the book was if you had enough time to read. This would show you also how skinny it was. Um, but it would also show you how many times the book had circulated. So in this particular case, Gravity's Rainbow corresponds to um, 26 circulations in that you know, course of time um, across the, the, the library system. Um, and the darker they were, the less popular the versions were. And you can imagine if you were a graduate student and you were interested in, I don't know, say, checking out the Iliad, and you wanted to figure out which of the 75 versions that exist of the Iliad is the best translation or the best one with the best forward, um, it might actually be helpful to have that information. And again, that's the metadata that libraries have and that we could surface in these interesting ways. Um, we also played around with ways in which you could present how many times has a professor checked this out versus how many times a graduate student versus how many times an undergraduate, right? And so if you're the, if you're the graduate student, maybe you want to know the professors, you know, and vice versa. If they're students, maybe the graduate students. Um, we also discovered at Harvard um, by virtue of doing this, um, that what was most popular for professors to check out was not, you know, esoteric volumes, but was DVDs. So anyway, you, you find really interesting things when you, uh, when you look at this. Um, one of the fun things about the DPLA already, just in a very short period of time, um, the number of different topics that people have been curating out there in the country is totally awesome and, and fabulous. So um, you mentioned that you have uh, the biographer of Edith Kermit Roosevelt um, coming. There's a, a series of um, uh, Teddy Roosevelt materials and the, and the national parks that has been curated. Um, people out there in the world have been curating digital collections along so many different dimensions. And I'm sure even in this community, there are people who have been doing this. Um, and I liken it in a way to the Wikipedia process of creating encyclopedia pages. I, as a volunteer to Wikipedia, I, um, because I did my graduate work on Alexander Hamilton, I look after the Alexander Hamilton page. And if somebody messes with it, I go in there and you know, <laughs> correct it. Right? I think what's happening in the library world is something similar. Is people learn something about a topic and become expert in it and are actually curating really interesting things. And I think the DPLA, in concert with libraries, can do a similar thing with library uh, and archival materials. Um, Ultimately, um, it's about, I think, creating a series of different user experiences, things that will allow people to um, experience libraries and, and, uh, and the information in new and exciting ways um, that I honestly believe are more powerful um, when they're combined with the physical uh, environments that we have. Um, and this is really, I think, in a way, the core of my argument about why libraries are more important in the digital age, because I think we can create user experiences that actually don't exist today, and which aren't in my head or any of our heads yet, um, but it is about creating the environment to make that successful um, in the digital environment. It will require much more collaboration among libraries. It will require much more collaboration with tech companies and um, startups and people who will have you know, purple hair and lots of different um, earrings and piercings and other things all need to be working on this topic along with people who have traditionally worked in libraries. Um, and I think it will be very, very successful. Um, going back to the sort of iconic um, images of libraries, this is one that I love. Um, it's near my, uh, my home. Uh, it's the, um, the Quincy Library, and it's where uh, the uh, John Quincy Adams materials are and so forth just outside of Boston. Um, and I love this one much like I love the historical one of Oliver Wendell Holmes. Junior, in part because of these big books that are here on the table. It just looks like exactly the environment that you want to come to to explore knowledge, right? You just, it draws you in. It's a beautiful, beautiful space. Um, but you think about this as being so incredibly uh, sort of aristocratic in a sense, right? This is the version that only a small number of people could come to to consult these volumes. And I feel like we are at the moment where we could have all, exactly the opposite, right? You think about the, the Library of Alexandria, the place that had drew you know, for hundreds of years all of the world's knowledge, in a sense, to one place at the time. That was the thought. We actually can have 
the Digital Library of Alexandria and have it be free to all if we were just to go out and create it. It would have, I think, all of the appeal of something like this and just as wonderful, but not the exclusivity. And I think that's where this exciting idea about libraries at the core of democracy um, is so powerful and important. And I think we can do it also in a global environment. And this is, I think, where um, it's different from that Library of Alexandria. If you think back you know, thousands of years, um, the Library of Alexandria was really important because it was the notion that you could bring all of knowledge together in one place. But it was limited in the sense that it was one place where things would come. And you actually had to have people come into the port of Alexandria. And you probably knew this, but it was a rule. But by fiat, the materials would then be copied and put into this, uh, the library. Um, and the emperors at various levels, Ptolemy and so forth, would send people out to other places to copy their materials and bring them to Alexandria. The advantage we have today with the internet um, and with the World Wide Web is that we actually don't have to have it in one place. We can actually draw upon everything that's out there. And it turns out, when I'm talking about the digital library platform in the United States, we are not ahead of the game. We're actually behind a lot of other countries. Um, and I don't say this in a national competitiveness. We need to do it um, for chest thumping purposes. But I think we need to do it because there's a huge opportunity. There's something called Europeana in Europe that has um, uh, strung together lots of the different uh, cultural heritage materials. South Korea has a digital uh, library. And I don't think what we need to do is have one big United Nations of libraries where everybody does uh, kind of exactly the same thing. But I actually think think that if we create a series of these systems, a series of these platforms, you could imagine the ability from anywhere in the world to get access to the digital, digitized materials um, that every country has created. Um, I think you could create something that really has just never existed before in mankind and could be an extraordinary thing. Um, ultimately, this is a map of utopia. Um, I think there is a possibility to think about this in really, really um, utopian terms. And I actually think that's a wonderful, um, a wonderful way to approach the digital era. I realize that you might say it's Pollyanna-ish and you know, it's going to go in another direction. I think it's possible that we will not actually create something um, that is so great. But I also think it is entirely possible that if we were to collaborate, if we were to take all of those principles that lie behind libraries and the reasons that people are so excited about libraries at the core of democracy, and you apply those to the digital world and all the things we've learned in building the internet, I actually think we can create something that is worthy of uh, a utopian name. And I think it is going to be something that could create so much more access to opportunity, to jobs, and all the things that libraries have done so well. So it's out there. It totally is a possibility. Um, and in writing this book and uh, coming to talk with all of you, and I'm so impressed you're all here um, in this physical space to talk about the future of libraries, I think the answer is if we just roll up our sleeves and we have the public spirit front and center, and we have that same uh, kind of American can-do, public and private coming together spirit, that we can create something, a future for libraries, that in a digital age is actually vastly better than what we have today. Um, but I think it will take a huge amount of good old American ingenuity, um, and I think it will take a huge amount of collaboration. And with people like Crosby Kemper and those who work with him, I think it is entirely possible. And I would love to do it with all of you. Thank you so much. <laughs>
the National Archives, led by David Ferry, who's a completely amazing guy. He is so two feet in on this, and he's done, been at every meeting, and he, he's contributing all of our National Archival stuff. The Smithsonian is totally in. The Government Printing Office is totally in. The White House is completely supportive. Why the Library of Congress, which I actually think is all of our library, um, would not think that digitizing materials and sharing them in this way was a good idea is completely beyond me. And I, I am beyond, I should probably be more politic and not be in a public space saying why are they not. I just have gotten to the point where five years in, I just don't understand it. So it's a, it's a bizarre thing. Lots has been digitized and lots could be made available um, through this mechanism in the Library of Congress and I hope that they will decide to participate. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Where you have to just say, look, this high tech company or this senator or this governor or this powerful entity like long term is going to not be good. I think that's true. Yeah. I am all for, you know, taking a children's crusade up to the state house and you know bringing 75 people. I think it's fabulous, and we should absolutely be incredibly proud of what you guys did. Um, I don't know if it's possible. It would be possible for me to play that video. Have you guys seen the video of this? Okay. So I actually I, I had it queued up, but I'd love to, if you're willing to let me show the, well, are you okay if we show it? It's, it's really, really great, so we'll, we'll do that in the background. Um, but, you know, one of the arguments I make in my book, some of the librarians I'm most sort of intrigued by are those who are actually just becoming really political, right? In fact, what they're doing is they're creating listservs of people who are members of the community, and I consider myself, I'm just, I'm a, I'm just a guy who loves libraries, right? I think that's probably why many of us are here who want to be political actors and want to convince people that this is crucial. But I think calling out the, the negative consequences of library cuts is really crucial. And I, so yes, collaboration, but I also think pointing out the, 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 the ludicrousness of, uh, of uh, some of what's going on is, is essential. So totally with you. Yes, sir. Yes. It's an awesome question. Um, so one of the things I think that I'm most impressed by among librarians, and this is from when I was a, a law professor, I was working on issues like privacy and copyright. Librarians, every time, were there before the lawyers were. I mean, librarians are so great on privacy and are so great on, um, on issues like copyright. So um, I actually trust the library community to create something that is effective in this way. But I will say there have been so many conversations in building this about the importance of not creating something that's really just for the NSA, right? Or just um, for the, um, that will be a kind of undermining of civil liberties. Um, so, so far in using the DPLA, there's no data collected about anybody who accesses it. There's not, you don't sign in to use it and so forth. What is tricky and is important to note is um, uh, if we go to a world in which you are borrowing materials digitally, you need some form of authentication to say who you are and how long you have it for. Um, and that is itself a very, very, you know, it just creates that potential link and that potential for, um, uh, you know, for abuse of it. And I think it's something really to worry about. But I, I trust in librarians in this way. They're the, the, the librarians are honestly the most privacy protective, you know, group of people I've ever encountered, and it's fabulous. Can we play it? Video of the rally, or would you like it of the interaction in the office? I, what, I, think both I think both would be great if you're willing to do it. Yeah, yeah, I, I love it. So. Yeah. Well, and I wanted to say, um, I, you know, the, we're not all nice. Um, <laughs> 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 you know, neither Crosby nor myself are shy when it comes to politics. You know, very different backgrounds. Um, but that's, I think, the beauty of the library is it brings together so many people from different, different ideologies. I think.
maybe in struggles with democracy is a real. And, yeah. and these guys did not ask to do this. This is this is totally on me. But I think it's really a great a great example. The governor, the secretary of state, the legislature needs to live up to their obligation. Provide a public library, free public library, and every one of you knows why this is so important. It's so important because of you, and it's about you. The library. Yeah. Yeah. We use the library for knowledge. We use our books. We use the internet. We need this. And so we all come here today, we all, to show that this is how important much it is to us. I want to say that without it, how can everybody get around the world? You have families across the world. You can't get in touch with them, but you have the internet. You have the social network, Facebook, Twitter, Yahoo, email. And then look what's going to happen if the internet's gone. You see how important it is to us? Yeah! yeah. yeah. I just want to say thank you all for coming and giving a good support for the libraries. Yeah. Libraries not only connect you with your community, but also the world around you. Ignorance is something that is combated by education. And through libraries, it is free, available, and public to any demographic of people. And that is something incredibly important to Americans as citizens. The people that are here, that are going to be in inside, are going to be delivering the message to the, to the governor and to the legislators to let them know that we are here for a victory. We are here to get this money restored. We are here to make the libraries most important. Yeah. Meet with us and explain why subsidies for stadiums in large cities that promote and support only big businesses are more, and more important than the institutions that support everyone in this state of great state of Missouri. Yeah! I grew up on the streets. Library is my outlet. I know a lot of people that like me that go to libraries. We need them. If we lose all this money, we get shut down. Yeah. Where are we going to go? I hear kids getting shot on the streets every day. I'm not one of them because I found the library. Yeah. 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 
didn't think I'm going to take uh, okay, the Okay, please go to the hallway. Yeah. I understand what you all are doing, and you're going to a very cause. I don't understand what this is for me. Thank you so much. This has been a ton of fun, and I'm so proud of what you're doing, and really, Definitely. really excited Thank to be here. You Thank, you. Thank you.